But anyway, but there's plenty of room if anybody wants to bring chili. I'm going to do a vegetarian chili, and um, we probably need one other type of soup or stew or something for people who are not into chili. So if anybody wants to come sign up for that or for desserts, I'll leave this up here on the organ for the next couple of Sundays. Um, our next community meal will be Wednesday, December the 14th. It's always the second Wednesday of the month. So there we go. And what time and is that? It starts at 5 30. So invite your friends, anybody else you know of who's into the whole chili cook off thing. And um, that would be that would be fabulous. I'll try to come up with surprises or something. Like a can of corn for the corniest chili. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a master chili, a master chili cooker um, like certificate or something of that nature. Um and the rest of them you can read down there for yourself. Does anybody else have another announcement that you'd like to make? Okay. So let's uh, turn our hearts and minds to worship today as a need of place to pray with you. Thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God of hope, we come to worship today to hear your good news, to hear of faith, hope, and love ringing out from your kingdom. We know that doubt, fear, and hatred can shape even the strongest. Shape us into faithful, hopeful people and fill us with your love that passes all understanding. We pray this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, uh, if you would, please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Come, celebrate God's gift of hope that ignites our hearts with praise. Come, join the celebration and be warned by the Spirit that calls us to serve. And now, if you would please remain standing and sing our hymn of praise, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus in Your United Methods, page 196. tradition that we've long since lost track of how we got to be. Well, the word Advent means like the coming of an event or a person or, or something like that is the term Advent. And so the Advent season is a season in which we anticipate the birth of Christ. Christmas is coming. The Advent wreath here started as a German and Scandinavian home devotional practice way back in the day. And what they did was they would set up a little place where they would put four candles. And each week, each Sunday before Christmas, or one day a week before Christmas, they would uh, choose a time during the day and the family would light one candle the first week and then two candles the next week. And it symbolized waiting. They were waiting for Christmas to come, waiting for the birth of Jesus. But it also was an increase of light until pretty soon all the candles were burned. And of course, in those days, it didn't matter what the candles looked like. And they were a variety of colors, whatever people could get a hold of, whatever shapes and sizes. And it wasn't necessarily a wreath. It could be just lined up on a mantelpiece or, or wherever. 
In the 19th century, the late 19th century, um, churches began incorporating this tradition of lighting candles. And because the spaces were larger and it was a public um, place, the candles kind of got bigger and things got arranged a little bit more conveniently. And so was born the Advent wreath with the candles. If you look at a huge church like Washington National Cathedral, for example, they have enormous candles because it's such a huge space they've got to fill. So each church will have an appropriate arrangement of, of candles. And they were any color, back in the day they were any color, but now we use um, purple or blue to go with the parents for the season, the Advent season. And this to signify the, the kingdom of God, the royalty of Jesus. Um, and so uh, by our practice of lighting the Advent candles, we want, a, and oh, and the other thing that happened too is that they developed themes and church supply houses about the middle of the 20th century started doing liturgies and sending out things that people could use for lighting the Advent wreath. And so the themes of the Advent wreath are hope, peace, joy, and love, not necessarily in that same order. Although the third Sunday is always the joy Sunday. So our candles are purple, except for the joy candle, which is pink. And that's, that's kind of become the tradition in the latter half of the 20th century. And now as we go into the 21st century. And so think about reclaiming the original home use idea of marking time and of ever increasing light. I know my children used to love the Advent candle and uh, they would light it not once, a, not once a week, but four or five times a day, we'd have to light the Advent candle because you know, little pyromaniacs that they were, <laughs> they, they loved lighting it. Um, but that was cool to have it because it was the same thing we were doing at church and it was, it was a lot of fun until Robert nearly set his hair on fire. And then we had to have some added candle rules. But anyway, so this morning, uh, Major and Danielle are going to do the readings and light the first um, candle of Advent. Good morning. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalms 122, verse 1. We are glad, whether we drove in or climbed up, whether we logged on or tuned in, we are glad to be here in this community with this family. It is a place of joyful hope, of radical welcome. It is a place where together we can wait in wondrous anticipation of the kingdom to come. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways, and that we may walk in God's path. Elijah, Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 3. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our joyous hope, that we can be restored our faith restored, our strength restored, our confidence restored, our joy restored, as we watch and wait with all God's people for the promise to be fulfilled. Yeah, that was fun. The one thing I failed to mention is the candle in the middle is referred to as the Christ candle, and that one will be lit on Christmas. It's time now to share our celebrations and concerns. Uh, Sylvia has some from the Sunday school class. I Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad to see everyone here. Uh, blessings from both Sunday school class. Thanksgiving is certainly a blessing. Our angel tree being placed up. The wedding of our pastor's 
sun. Um, and thanks to all of those that decorated our church for the upcoming Christmas season. Marshall and Julie, happy anniversary, 30 years. Our concerns are, we need to please look up these people in prayer. Danielle's family as they search for residential placement for her grandmother. Stephen Doxey's daughter, we need to continue to lift up Jesse and her family. Uh, those that are sick, we have a lot of illness traveling through our community with the viral infections and different things going on. Please be mindful of that. Um, we need to bring up the Etheridge family, Barbara Etheridge passed away. Please continue to bring them up in prayer. Eddie Griggs' family, I'm not sure what's going on with Eddie's. Uh, Eddie did on Thanksgiving. Ooh, okay. Mm. All right. Uh, Joan and Tom Wright, they're from Church's Island or Ward Lily. I don't know what to refer that area community as anymore. John and Beth Childers. Um, Traveling Mercies for Ken and Jan Edgar and Brian Owens. Anyone else have anybody that they need to lift up today or the same phrases for today? Okay. Thank you. And I've got more angels coming. We've got another family. Yeah. Let's pray. God of hope. And God of peace and joy and love, be with us today. Sit beside us. Be within us as we come to worship you, to celebrate the Advent season, and to know that our trust can be placed in you. Lord, we ask that you are with those who are mentioned who are sick or grieving, struggling financially, struggling with depression or addiction. We know, Lord, that the world is full of needs and griefs. We grieve the mass shootings. We grieve um, the evil that sometimes seems to overwhelm us. But God, we know that you are here, and that you are a God of hope. We ask that you, we thank you, Lord, too, uh, for all of the many blessings. We thank you for family gatherings at Thanksgiving, for beautiful little babies and children that we have in our families and amongst our friends. We thank you for this community, a community that cares about other people. Lord, help us be your people in this community as we celebrate this Advent season. In Jesus' name we pray. And now, as Jesus taught us to pray, let us say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
time to uh, pick up our tithes and our offerings. And as you know, our tithes and offerings go many, many places throughout the connection. Um, I was reading uh, just this morning about um, some of the success stories of the Zoe um, project, which is a project, it started in Africa, now it extends all over Africa and parts of Asia. And it's an empowerment project. Instead of like, giving just building orphanages or give money they offer ways that people can build small businesses to support themselves if you have never looked at that zoe empowerment project that's one of the many things that our conference and uh, united methodist church at large uh, supports so take a look at that sometime that's uh it's very heartwarming the things that are being done all over the world so if our pressures will come forward here. <laughs> Thank you. 
passage that I've chosen, the first one, I'm going to save that one, next one a little bit, but it's Romans 5, 1 through 5, this is the NRSV version, if you can follow along in the, with the few Bibles or read another version, it's fine. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So in this Advent leading up to Christmas, the four weeks leading up to Christmas, what kind of feelings do we have? And you know what? This is a side note, but here's the thing about worship. We are all worshiping in community. This is not a presentation and an audience kind of event, even though our buildings are designed that way. So today, I'll ask some questions, and I would be glad to hear from anybody that wants to pipe up and, and join in the conversation. So what kind of feelings are you feeling now in anticipation of Christmas? Happy. Happiness? Excited. Excitement? Joy. Joy? Sadness. There's some sadness, that's right. Right, your family, you're feeling love and that warm contentment you get with the, with the hope that your family is, is coming or the knowledge that you're gonna have family around. Caring. Caring, good, yeah. So there's lots and lots of feelings that are associated with this Advent season. Um, unfortunately, some people have just recently lost a loved one or or feel overwhelmed by life, or are lonely. 
And so there are some negative feelings associated too, and I think it's important for us to recognize that and think about those negative feelings when we also are thinking about all the good things that happen during the season. Because for some people, it's not, not such a happy, exciting kind of season, you know. Their family's far away or they, um, you know, there, there are any number of reasons why people may not, um, may not be excited at this season. Um, and when we talk about hope, you know, we have material hopes and kids particularly. If we have any kids in here, you can ask a kid, you know, what do you hope for for Christmas? And, you know, it would be stuff like a PlayStation or whatever the latest thing is. Clearly, I'm out of touch, but, you know, <laughs> um, you know, or whatever kind of toy or bicycle or, or something like that. That's what they're hoping for. And even as adults, we have hopes, material hopes. Um, you know, we hope our dinner is, turns out well. We hope we don't burn something, you know, all those kinds of little things, those little hopes. But there's also long-term hope. And that's sort of what the hope of Advent is about, is that kind of long-term, that sense of hopefulness about our world, even in the face of things that seem to defy that hope. Um, I know that, um, that everybody was watching the news about the shooting at Walmart in Chesapeake, and all the other things that happen in the world. And sometimes that kind of stuff tends to distract us from a sense of hope. You hear people say, you know, I'm ready to give up. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, as it were. You know, that it's just so terrible here around. And so we have a tendency to to draw away from this hope that Paul's talking about in Romans. The hope that comes because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And we have, you know, it, it all kind of depends on our focus, I think. We kind of lose focus on that. And when our focus gets distracted off by all, all these other, you know, diseases and news and, and all the rest of it. So I thought I would ask the, uh, the congregation, all of us, what kinds of things give you, you that sense of hope that God is in control, that everything will be okay? Um, what kinds of things give you hope? Anybody want to share something? You can stand up or just share from where you're seated. I'll try to repeat it for the Zoomers here. Our food pantry. Sylvia so says our food pantry gives her hope. It does. Because of the outpouring of people that don't have and but willing to give. So people who are willing to give and the gratitude of the people who are receiving who at this moment are in need and who may not be um, at some other point. Anybody else have something that gives you hope? Well, I think that but, uh, like you were talking about all the distractions in this world, the thing that gives me hope is showing up here every Sunday and recharges my battery and enables me to go back out and face another week of Amen. who knows what. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So the power of this community of faith, the body of Christ, being with people here and being in the community and being in the body of Christ gives you hope and recharges you and, and kind of Recenters you, yeah. I have one. Go ahead. Um, I don't have the opportunities to experience this much anymore, but it, every time I hear or read about or see um, something being done by, let's say, someone under 30, <laughs> I just get so hopeful that we're going to make it. <laughs> because sometimes we hear so much about kids and, and young people and have. There was not going to write in, but man, there are some powerful, powerful young people out there these days. Amen. Yeah, yeah there, there are, are some are. powerful yeah. young people. That is, that is very, very true. And it is, it's encouraging when you see younger people, um, you know, giving and, and helping um, all kinds of acts of kindness give me hope. Uh, from even little things like somebody who, 
reach something for you at the grocery store if you're too short to get it uh, off the shelf. Yeah. Or it's got on the bottom shelf all the way in the back, and some of us no longer are capable of getting down our hands and knees. Or rather, if we got down on our hands and knees, oh, we are yeah. incapable of getting back up again. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, but yeah, you see acts of kindness, and I think people have a lot of empathy. Um, and when, like, even in a situation that's as horrible as that shooting, there's just been an outpouring of empathy and compassion in the community for the folks who were impacted by that. Um, anybody else? Yeah, yeah Jen. I have a little brag. My uh, granddaughter was about four years old, and when we all got in the circle and joined hands to say the blessing, for the next year, she asked if she could say the blessing. Aww. And you will not believe she said the blessing. Oh, that's a That's a blessing, and that gives you hope for the future, yeah. Anybody have another one you want to share? And gee, I know we hear about this, and I don't know if it's just me, but you know, I go along my daily walk. I don't encounter ugly, evil people. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I sat and thought about that. How many people have I encountered in the past week that were rude or ugly? And I can tell you it was not any. Uh, you know, uh, the laughter down at Publix was unbelievable. Well, no, I'm sorry, it was Food Line in Los City, and the guy was preaching back there by the mill. <laughs> it was hilarious. I just loved it. it. You know, I got right in tune with it. So, I, you know, for the most part, I only encounter goodness. Yeah, I think we all encounter a lot more goodness that would outweigh the bad. But you know, as a as a retired teacher, and those of you who've ever taught. I know you, you know this situation where one child that's giving you grief will outweigh the other 20 some odd of them ever have any that are being perfectly fine. But, right. but you know, so we have a tendency sometimes to focus on the bad and not on the good. So I think that the Advent Candle of Hope encourages us to focus on the good, to really look for, for things that are hopeful. I find a lot of hope in nature. Um, I've gotten into the habit of going out with my cup of tea in the morning and wrapping it up in whatever I need, depending on the temperature, and kind of watching the sunrise, or if I'm up a little bit later, watching the play of light on the clouds and watching the birds. And when it rained, whatever day that was, a couple of days ago, it was raining early in the morning. And my neighbor has a a guttering system that comes off his garage and it, it makes this little pool down there at the bottom. And let me tell you, the birds were going about in, in that thing. They were taking a serious bird bath. <laughs> they were just, and one of them stayed there the whole time. The rest of them kind of came and went, but that guy stayed in the bathtub a good 30 minutes, it seemed like. And I thought, it's so wonderful. You just see things in nature like like that, that are encouraging. To me, that's hopeful. It gives me hope because it reminds me of the cycles of nature and growth. There's death, of course, but there's growth and there's, and the sun rises every morning. And I don't know if you're an early person like I am. But let me tell you, the sky this morning was red. It was red, which I guess means we're going to have rain, as we will discover when we step out the door, no doubt. Thank you all for coming out in the rain. Um, one of the um, one of the, one of a cool story in the Bible to me is in Jeremiah, <clears throat> and you know Jeremiah was the prophet to the people that ended up getting taken into captivity by the Babylonians, and that was a very difficult and, and horrible time for them to be overtaken, the country being overtaken by the Babylonians and a whole gang of them being carried off to a foreign country to be captive. And Jeremiah had warned them. He spends about half the book of Jeremiah warning them that something bad is going to happen. And then in fact it does. And they get carried off. <clears throat> and so, um, but he says at some point in there, he says, you know what? Go ahead and plant your gardens. Have families, get married. Everything's going to be all right in the long haul. We're here for a while, but it's going to be all right. God's got this. 
And sure enough, they were in captivity for 70 years. So, you know, a lot of the older people never saw the outcome. But some baby that was born in captivity ended up living in freedom. Um, and, and a lot of people, because the Jews eventually did end up being able to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. So I find that kind of story in the Bible, and there are a lot of them like that. That's a very hopeful story to me. And we don't see the outcome. You may never see the outcome. You may never see a time, you know, like is prophesied in Isaiah, when there is no more war, when there's no more hate. You, you, you may not see that in your lifetime. But you have hope, trusting in God, that it will happen. I found this cool little thing that the letters of hope stand for hospitality, opportunity, purpose and engagement. Hospitality is this, comes from the same root word that the word hospital comes from. And there is hope in healing. Um, and so anytime that we have the opportunity to heal relationships, to um, help somebody toward healing, I think that is a hopeful thing. Opportunity, of course, is looking for places where we can serve God. And we've been about that in this church. We now have the community meal. We've got a food um, pantry that's open once a month. We, you know, we have the blessing box. We're trying to do things that are opportunities to serve God. And that's part of hope. That's the other of hope. And purpose, of course, is answering a higher calling or meaning in life. And so I think that if we have a sense of purpose that we're serving God, even if, not if, but when we make mistakes or we, um, we offend without knowing it or all the other things that are part of the human condition, we know that our purpose is our reason for living, that our purpose of serving God is our reason for living. And engagement, the definition they gave here, which I really like, says, is a joining together in a magical moment to help make something happen. And that's kind of what Sylvia was talking about in her work in the food pantry. It's a joy, it's a, it it's a, gives her hope on all sides of that because it's a joining together in that magical moment to help make something happen. It's taking on a relationship with others. I'd like to read you a quote I found. Um, there's a writer called Everhard Arnold, a German writer. Um, and he says, Advent hope is a certainty of faith that shows itself in action through mutual responsibility for the whole of life. And this is my favorite sentence in here. The church is the fellowship of this hope. So we are a fellowship of hope. God embraces everything. When we trust in him for the future, we trust for the present. When we have faith in him, our faith holds true for everything that touches our lives. And so I thought that was, that was pretty insightful, um, an insightful way of looking at, at hope. And I'm going to save that other Romans reading for our benediction. But... I want you to think about, as we leave here today, think about ways that you can nurture that hope inside yourself. Think about all the things that make you hopeful. And when you hear stuff on the news or whatever that starts to suck that hope out of you, just turn it off and go sit with God for a while. Just, you know, focus on the things that, that give you hope. I think you'll be a much happier person that way. So... Major gives me hope, right there. Major and I are the chief cooks and bottle washers for the, uh, for the community people. No, Julie is the chief bottle washer. I usually try to disappear when bottle washing comes about, but anyway. But there's loads and loads of things. I'd like to close with the hymn called Hymn of Promise on page 707. I like this. I mean, this is, this is a song that talks about the hope that we have, the long-range hope. Page 707 is our closing. Um, okay, Anita's going to play it through one time so you can get the tune in your head.
benediction from Romans 15 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.